Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leaning off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also, here is Jeremy Johns. Part of your day, and it is, uh, it's is—it's slightly early today, but it's a good kind of early. We love this. It's like daylight savings, but for movies. <laughs> also, here's Ken Napsok. Hey, everybody. I'm back, and uh, what a wonderful weekend for trailers just dropping left and right. A lot of things. A lot of homework this morning, John. <laughs> yeah, a lot, yes. <laughs> also, here's Mark Ellis. I didn't really notice all the trailers dropping because I was watching the Seahawks-Patriots game last night. How'd that work out, John? Shut up. All right. I, I, just, want, <laughs> I just wanted to point out, guys, that we... Uh, as you may have noticed, we were um, dark, uh, if you will, for Thursday afternoon and Friday because we brought in a whole slew. We've got, it's hard to tell from where you guys are sitting at home right now, but we brought, like, we exchanged out all of our gear, all of our equipment from our cameras and our switchers and cabling and all that kind of stuff. So you might see a few bumps in the road as we do the show today as we're getting used to all the new equipment and gear, but we hope you will hang with us. And let's get things started with the first big trailer that dropped. The first full trailer for Disney's Beauty and the Beast has been released online. The movie stars Emma Watson as Belle, the title Beauty, alongside Dan Stevens as the Beast. Directed by Bill Condon, the movie is based on the 1991 animated musical that will also see eight-time Oscar-winning composer Alan Menken returning with more music. The movie also stars Luke Evans, Josh Gad, Kevin Kline, Stanley Tucci, Ewan McGregor, Ian McKellen, and Emma Thompson. It opens in theaters on March 17, 2017. John, thoughts on the first full trailer for Beauty and the Beast? I'm not going to lie to you. I loved it. It sent chills <laughs> up and down my arms and my spine. I absolutely adored it. I think Luke Evans is going to be an amazing Gaston. We only just got to see some some shots of him uh, in the role of Gaston. I think he's going to be just terrific in that role. I think Emma Watson is going to be amazing as Belle. I watched it and I was just flushed with all my feelings of watching the animated film at the same time. This is going to be a true remake in live action form. I'm as excited as hell. I got excited when I saw the still images that we talked about last week. I thought those looked really great. I, the trailer fulfilled everything that I wanted it to. I think this is going to be something really special. What about you, Mark? John, I haven't been this excited about a beast since I went to Arby's last week. This trailer <laughs> was absolutely everything that I thought it could be because I grew up, and I actually really love the animated one. Like, I wasn't a big Little Mermaid guy, but once Beauty and the Beast hit in the early 90s, I was like, Disney is making some damn fine cinema, and what they want to do with these live-action adaptations is give us those nostalgic tinges but open it up for a new generation to appreciate. That's exactly what this trailer did. My only complaint in any of this is that the first time I saw the beast, the first time I saw the talking clock or the spoon or whatever the hell the kitchen appliances are that are his wingmen, they looked a little CGI to me. It looked a little more CGI, and I think a lot of that is because I was so spoiled with the Jungle Book this past April that anything that doesn't look as good as those animals is going to be like, ah, you're not quite there. Other than that, though, I think this is tremendous, and my bold prediction of this movie making $200 million opening weekend is alive and well. Well, well, look, I was excited about it. You were excited about it, but I don't think anybody's enthusiasm you know, equaled that of Ken Napsox. Uh, Ken, uh, you were like a kid on Christmas morning. <laughs> what did you think about this trailer? Look, I'll say this right now. I, I definitely, I don't want to say I'm not in the demographic because when you live in a time, there's no uh, blue and pink in the toy aisles anymore. Everyone can like anything. Um, but, and you crazy person with your $200 million in one weekend. Yeah. Look, it might be because I spent my entire life as a beast and I can tell you, ain't no girl magically shows up and turns you back into a human, all right? <laughs> I might not be the one that's touches in here. This is going to kill. It's going to crush with Without a doubt, this is going to be a very successful movie. It's going to be one of the most successful box office winners of 2017. But there is something freaky. I don't want to rap report this. There's something <laughs> freaky with a real human walking around in a talking candlestick with an accent. Like, why are you not slapping this thing away? It's just, it, there's something that's off-putting to me about this. I'm not even trying to do this for comedy. I woke up, watched this, like, what's this all about? This is like an acid trip. It's like a worse acid trip than Doctor Strange to me. I know I'm in the minority on this. I absolutely know. No one's going to convince me that this is going to bomb. This is going to succeed. But I was a little freaked it's out. It's an interesting point you bring up because when it is live action and you see a... 
a real human being talking to a candlestick. It just it, it's like we're almost in the real world now, and that shouldn't happen. But when everything is drawn, you just give it a little bit more of a leeway. Exactly my point. Again, I I understand what they're doing with these live action remakes. We can do them now. We but it, there's some. It's almost like a weird sketch in a weird way. Like what if Emma, Emma Watson was here with a clock and it's talking? I, I I'm not into it. I'm also, not into yeah, it. I defended you, but you also have no soul. Jeremy, I, I love the fact that you're wearing green today, Grinch. You're going to be like, all the who's down in Whoville will all cry boo. <laughs> Getting to know me well. <laughs> and I love it to death. Uh, no, I like this trailer. I really did. The problem I run into is not really a problem. The problem the movie is going to face. I smacked your laptop. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, is that um, the, the Jungle Book had wiggle room to give us new stuff. Beauty and the Beast is something that, I mean, I feel like when watching the trailer, I know exactly how it's going to play out because it's going to play out like the animation. The one thing I didn't like in the trailer is when she says, show me your face. And he's kind of just like one of those, here's my face. And in the animation, he steps into the light and like, you know, the light goes around him and she freaks it's very out. Dramatic. You know? I hope that it's just the way the trailer was cut. And it's a different scene because I want his reveal to her to be that dramatic. But I really did like it, man. When that music comes on, the dun, 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 dun took me right back it's it's the early 90s all over again I'm looking forward to it and let's be honest that was the job of this trailer yeah. it wasn't to show us all the great right. scenes all those reveals this trailer was to introduce that there's a Beauty and the Beast movie right. coming out show us some footage for us to gush over give us little tinges of like what you brought up with Gaston like oh that's the character I love or that's the character I love we didn't get a lot of story <laughs> here but I loved what this trailer did you heard it here internet Mark Ellis loves Gaston the <laughs> other thing that I think was the purpose of this trailer is not just to announce that this movie is coming sometimes you get uh, you know, movies based on pre-existing property. It's like the purpose of this trailer was to let you know this ain't your dad's name of property mm. here. This isn't the same name of property that your grandparents remember. I believe that the purpose of this trailer was to let everybody know this is the beauty and the beast that you know and love brought to live action. That was the message they were communicating, I think, with this particular trailer, was to say, yeah, yeah, if some of you are worried we're going to radically change the story and give a brand new interpretation, no, no, no. This is, sorry, Riley, the tale as old as time. Oh. This is the <laughs> traditional one that you grew up loving, that your kids have watched, that you watched as a kid. This is the movie they were bringing to you. And if that was indeed the purpose of the trailer, they did a pretty damn good job because that's what was communicated. Now, what I am dying to know is what Ashley Mova and Wendy Lee thought about this particular trailer because those two Grinches didn't like the still pictures of all. They had their little hater we corner. We didn't like the dress. Give us a right. break. <laughs> but, but they have not yet watched the trailer. They have saved themselves. So that didn't sound right. They are, <laughs> they are, they are waiting to watch the trailer so they can do an actual live reaction. So you can watch for their Beauty and the Beast trailer reaction a little bit later today on Collider Video. Keep your eyes open for that. All right, what's next? All right, Deadline reports that Paramount Pictures is close to getting Bumblebee, the first spinoff to its billion-dollar Transformers franchise, off the ground. The trade reports that the studio finally has a script it's pleased with and will shortly go out to directors. Christina Hodson, the writer on the project, recently turned in a script that will make it possible for Paramount to begin production with the release date currently set for June 8, 2018. John, what do you think about the Bumblebee spinoff moving forward with a director other than Michael Bay? Uh, well, with the director other than Michael Bay, look, I, everybody knows this. I was one of the few people in the world that supported the idea of Michael Bay directing this brand new Transformers thing they're doing. And I still firmly stand by that I really like the first Transformers. I know a bunch of people didn't. I did. I enjoyed the hell out of it. It's gone to hell since the first one. <laughs> but I really enjoyed the first one. Now I'm at the point where I am really ready for Michael Bay to get out of this project. To move away from it and go away. Did a great job on the first one. Everything else has sucked since then. So I'm kind of... What I am questioning here is, really? A Bumblebee spinoff? Like, seriously? I mean, I, I just don't see any sense. So, like, and what's the point of this? It's not like you're going to have just, oh, Bumblebee decided to vacation in Cannes, you know, over in France there for a while, and then got into some misadventures. It's, it's going to be a Transformers movie with maybe Bumblebee as a feature. I, I don't understand the purpose of this. I'm still excited about new Transformers. I'm still excited about Transformers without Michael Bay. I just don't get the point of this. Kenny, you heard about this. What do you think? 
Uh, I grew up a big Transformers fan, John. I am with you. I actually not disappointed with the, was not disappointed with the first movie. I actually kind of liked it, and it did go bad since then. Uh, I like the writer's room they put together. Christina Hodson's one of the uh, the best to come out of this writer's room that they uh, gather all these people to tell these Transformers stories. I, I agree with you. A Bumblebee spinoff, I can understand based on the movies. There's some comedy in there, I, I, but I don't know what you're going to do. Is you going to you know, tag, tag team up with Jazz or Blue Streak later on? Are you going to introduce other Transformers or characters or just kind of a fish out of water? Transformer comedy. I don't know that, but I'm willing to give it a chance because I like the idea there's enough within the Transformers universe that you can kind of dig in and have some fun, and I agree. Uh, let someone else take uh, take uh, the helm here. Maybe the fight scenes will be less dizzy. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, it's going to be a standalone Bumblebee movie where Bumblebee goes off to find himself, hangs out with some monks, and learns some magic. I think we got ourselves <laughs> something going on. Weirdest thing for the script, though. What are you going to do? Every time Bumblebee talks, are you going to play a sound clip from from a, a radio broadcast or a song or something? I, I don't know how they're going to... He's been working on his laryngitis for about 10 years, so I have no <laughs> idea. But uh, this the person who penned this script, aren't they the person who uh, wrote Shut In? That came out this week. Yes, weekend. that's I right. And, and, and that has glowing reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with this, but I agree with you all that Michael Bay should have stepped off a couple movies ago. So I'm looking forward to seeing what they do without him. So we got two things here, Margels. First of all, it's a new installment of the Transformers franchise. But isn't doing a Bumblebee spinoff movie like having a Van Halen movie franchise and doing a Michael Anthony spinoff standalone <laughs> film? Michael Anthony was a, a central part to the <laughs> early sound of Van Halen. Those high harmonizing vocals you hear, that's Michael Anthony contributing to the band. Um, I don't think it's anything like that because I think Bumblebee is not necessarily going to be the star of this movie in the same way that the Transformers, while that's what you paid money to go see in those movies, there's a lot of human being elements, especially in the first one where Bumblebee crashes in and Shia LaBeouf and Megan Fox and Bumblebee have to solve whatever's going on. So there's going to be humans in this movie. There's going to be a lot of humans in this film. What excites me about this is that they are taking a screenwriter like Christina Hodson who has a different voice, somebody who's a rising star in Hollywood as far as writing goes. I want to see what her take is. What concerns me is the same concern that I had with the Transformers excuse me, with the Ninja Turtles movies that came out because Michael Bay was producing those movies. He wasn't directing them. You could still feel the Michael Bay touch in there. It was almost like you could feel when they had to insert a, a, a ridiculous joke that didn't need to be there or another human character that we didn't need. I would rather see Bumblebee talk in nothing but music than have too many humans in this movie. My fear is that it's not going to go down that path. All right, what's next? More news about writer Christina Hodson. The Wrap is reporting she's also currently scripting the Harley Quinn slash Birds of Prey spinoff movie for Warner Brothers and DC Films. The trade reports that the film is not just a Quinn solo movie, but rather would feature multiple female superheroes and possibly villains in the DC Comics universe. Margot Robbie is attached to reprise her role as Quinn and is also producing the untitled project. No release date has been set. Jeremy, thoughts on the Harley Quinn Birds of Prey movie written by Bumblebee writer Christina Hodson. Wow, that's a second in a row. That girl's getting some work. Uh, I mean, well, there's no doubt that the two standouts in uh, Suicide Squad were Deadshot and uh, Harley Quinn, for sure. Um, I, I want to see Harley Quinn, but her alone isn't enough. I would have, uh, I'd like to see her with the Joker more. I want to see more of that yeah. element, you know, so I, I hope he's in it, and I hope these other heroes slash villains they may or may not have in the movie don't take away from that, but I feel like it's going to because the reception on Jared Leto's Joker was kind of lukewarm, um, but yeah, I, I hope a Birds of Prey-ish movie does uh, better than the CW show that came out within the early 2000s. <laughs> but I am looking forward to it. I really want to see Harley Quinn's standalone movie. Kenny. Uh, well, number one, congratulations, seriously, to Christina Hodson for breaking through. What I like yeah. about her is she has a development background. So yeah. she's not just a screener, so she's going to be able to develop a story. And I love that this kind of came out of Margot Robbie's passion for this character and, and, and the, support, the other birds of prey while researching the role. There's something that's really cool about an actor coming into a project and falling in love with the world so much that they drive a project forward. And I, I think there's hope for a, a struggling, uh, embattled DC Mark. I mean, look, Hodson coming out of this thing and getting to write a script like this, or for like Bumblebee for that matter, is proof that Hollywood is finally taking the cue that you need to have more diverse voices in film. And with this, the concern I have is that it all boils down to how much 
box office clout would Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn have? Because Suicide Squad did tremendous numbers, both domestic and international. Whatever you want to say about the third act of the movie, it made a lot of money. And I think a big reason why is because of Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. So I think this is a great idea to go forward with. And the fact that we're going to learn something new, that Birds of Prey aren't on the tips of everybody's you know tongue as far as these are the most popular characters we've ever seen. We actually get to learn something new as an audience about who these characters are. Maybe we get a new Suicide Squad feeling movie. Because I love the Suicide Squad. Mm. I just didn't like the movie they were in. If Hudson can write a better movie than what we got with Suicide Squad, I am totally on board with this. My biggest problem, I've voiced this kind of concern before, and it still stays true even with this screenwriter coming on, is that my criticism traditionally of Warner Brothers has been that they have never had a plan. They have always been reactionary. Mm -hmm. Oh, this didn't work. Let's change this. Oh, that didn't work. This changes it. Change this. And you just know that they didn't have a plan for a Harley Quinn feature film. They didn't. But then Suicide Squad comes out and says, hey, wait, the audience is, uh, they like Harley Quinn. Let's do a Harley Quinn movie, quick. And it seems like they're again falling back to being reactionary. I'm, I'm open to seeing a Harley Quinn movie. I am, even though she is just a girl with a baseball bat. But then again, Batman's just a dude with some money and some toys, if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> so I'm cool. But I really would have loved a Bonnie and Clyde kind of movie with her and the Joker, but everything being told from her point of view. I think that would have been really fascinating. But hey, maybe they have got a grander vision. Maybe they got a bigger idea, and we'll see how it works out. All right, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by AMC Theaters. Doctor Strange snagged the number one spot at the weekend box office for a second week in a row. The Marvel Studios release took in $43 million, with the film's domestic gross climbing to over $153 million in just 10 days of release. DreamWorks Animation's Trolls took the number two spot in its second weekend, pulling in $35 million, with the film's domestic total now at $94 million. In its opening weekend, Arrival took the number three spot with an impressive $24 million. Another opening weekend release, Almost Christmas, took the number four spot with $15.5 million. And rounding out the top five was Lionsgate's Hacksaw Ridge, taking in $10.8 million, with a domestic total of $32.2 million after just 10 days in release. Ken, thoughts on the weekend box office? I think this is kind of one of those Marvel punt weekends, just field position. Doctor Strange still holding strong, thanks to the great numbers that uh, our producer Mark Riley provided. Uh, Strange, a second weekend drops the best second weekend in the last 10 Marvel titles for a space wizard guy, a sorcerer supreme who's walking around with a cape that does things for him. That's a trippy movie that's doing such a good thing. And uh, it's heartening that uh, Arrival, which is getting so much good uh, word of mouth and an original idea, is holding strong. And I'm not making a joke here. Tyler Perry. His movie has made over $50 million. This yep. guy is a machine. He's still in the top 10, too. That's a little note I like. It well. made like $3.5 million on it's just over 2,000 screens. And it's November 14th. Yeah. It's a Halloween movie. Usually you get these things out the week before Halloween. You hope for a cash grab. And it's still making money. But I agree with you, Ken. I think that Marvel has got to be pleased as punch. And a lot of it is a strong word of mouth that really all three of these movies got. Because Trolls, I think, was better than people thought it would be. It, didn't, it wasn't just a cash grab. And Dr. Strange obviously got great reviews views as well as Arrival did. Arrival making $24 million also in a smaller amount of screens than what Doctor Strange or Trolls had to compete with. So that's very impressive to me. And I'll also throw The Accountant and Almost Christmas in there as movies that held very well. The Almost Christmas opening doing $15 million, yeah. almost making its budget back in week one. And that's going to have some legs because it's the only Christmas movie we have coming out for a little bit. You know, I there's a couple of really key things here. None of the movies in the top five that are in their second week or longer dropped more than 50 percent doctor strange only doc dropped for now you're pointing it out with the second best week to week drop that marvel's ever had from week one to week two the other thing though is trolls trolls going into its second week it only dropped 24 percent 24 percent because like you said i think word of mouth got out that hey guys you know what that trolls movie it actually wasn't that bad and now it's not going to be in my, probably my top four top five favorite animated films of the year but it's not been a bad year for animated films and trolls was certainly entertaining enough hacksaw ridge also only drops 29 percent from the previous week so word of mouth is getting out there that these movies are better than people thought or they're as good as people thought in the in the case of hacksaw ridge so this is some pretty impressive stuff anyway jeremy you see this list what stands out to you about the box office report uh yeah i i i mean i always say never underestimate the kids films i am surprised that trolls held on to number two 
But also, above that, never underestimate the Marvel films. Not surprised at all that Doctor Strange held on to number one. Um, I, I would have liked Arrival to be number two. I really want Arrival to do well because I want people to, you, you know, really receive the thinking man's alien invasion movie. Really, really happy that Hacksaw Ridge held on in the top five. I, I really am. That's one, of the, that's one of the best of the year for me. And uh, it, it really is a movie that you need to go see. And I'm glad that enough people saw it to remain in the top five. So, uh, what did I miss? Almost Christmas, I didn't. I didn't see because I also didn't see Trolls. There's like two of these top fives. I actually well, didn't. You were see. in the midst of moving from one part of the country to it the other. It doesn't matter, John. If Trolls comes John, out, he's got to yeah. see it. Yes. <laughs> do not, do not overplay an 1,100 mile uproot and move that changes your entire life, John. That is unacceptable. <laughs> things need to be seen. Words need to be said about. You're said watching your little football game last night. <laughs> yeah. There was a Trolls movie that they uh, sang for you, Jeremy. That was a you. great game. Go Hawks. <laughs> All right, guys, we reached that part of the show now for buy or sell here's how this works in front of her ass she's got a few other items in the world of movie news she's going to run them down then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or a sub. So, Ashley, what do we got? The first official trailer for Rupert Sanders' Ghost in the Shell officially dropped online yesterday. The movie stars Scarlett Johansson as the major and follows the elite team of Section 9 and their task to take out dangerous extremists and high-tech criminals. The live-action adaptation brings to life the classic manga comic and takes inspiration from the animated movies and series that followed the original 1995 anime. The film hits the big screen on March 31st, 2017. Mark Byers saw the first trailer for Ghost in the Shell. Ashley, I will buy it because I saw this trailer and I felt like a 10-year-old kid who found a Playboy magazine. Do I know exactly what I'm looking at? No, but it's exciting. It's new. It's fresh. I don't really understand everything that is going on on the page, but man, it's a whole new world. And I think that's what Ghost in the Shell is going to be. Rupert Sanders was the star. Rupert Why? excuse me, was the Rupert Sand. One of the Rupert Ruperts Sanders. was a star of this movie because it has such a visual flair that it's all its own it's it's got a science fiction vibe that is, that is something that you very rarely see in movies now when they're trying to throw cool looking explosions and action at you this one it was more cerebral it was it was quieter there was moments of intensity but also really developing a story at a at a calculated pace that impressed me for a trailer when they're still trying to sell this Ghost in the Shell property, I know a lot of people are hardcore fans of it. There's a lot of people that are wondering what the hell this thing is like me. And I got to say, I was pretty intrigued. What do you think, Kenny? I'm going to buy. It is a, it's a soft buy because I, I, I was confused. Maybe I'm just maybe I'm the problem. I just get confused <laughs> things I see. Uh, I'm not a, a fan of the manga, but I'm definitely aware of what it is. Definitely aware of the controversy with the casting in this movie, all those things. That's why I know about this movie. So this trailer was doing its job and going, well, that's what you heard. Here's what we're presenting to you. And it was it was fascinating and it's going to make me want to go see it. And that's what a trailer's supposed to do. Right. So I'll buy it. What do you think? Yeah, I'm going to buy it, too. I'm, I'm, with, uh, I'm between Ken and uh, Ellis over here. Uh, I, I'm going to buy it in the sense that, I mean, it looks big. It looks exciting. It looks really cool. I love, I, I love the, the fascinating lore that they explained out to me. Uh, what I don't like is every time, and I mean every time, a trailer says in there, and it has the guy who says, everything they told you is a lie. <laughs> now I know that everything that happens in the movie before I see that in the movie is bullshit. And I don't like that. I hate it when a trailer does that. This trailer did that. But the movie does look cool. But don't do that. <laughs> I'm going to sell it. Uh, and, here's, and, and here's why. If I didn't know, already know and love and appreciate Ghost in the Shell, so I, I've taken that aside, and I'm just watching this trailer as a pure blank canvas, much like we did with that Denny Villeneuve. What was the name of that, that film he just dropped the trailer for last week? Uh, that Not Fifth oh, Element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not <laughs> Fifth Element. Why am I forgetting the name of that? The, the, this, well, Valerian. Valerian, thank you. Like we did for Valerian, right? No, most people know nothing about it. I went into it with a clean slate, and I went, that trailer isn't that good. It, I don't feel any more desire to see it. Visually, it was beautiful, but I didn't feel any need to go see it. So now if I go into a Ghost in the Shell trailer and I remove the fact that I already know the story and I already love the original and all that kind of stuff and just watch it as a trailer, I don't see this trailer being much better than the Valerian trailer. I mean, we see some very cool visuals and you got a stare. I don't know how many trailers I've seen with a guy going, they what everything they told you right. was a lie. I mean, I've seen that played out a thousand times. So just as a trailer, the trailer did nothing for me. I have a lot of faith that this movie is going to be really good. Like, I have a lot of faith the movie's going to be good. But if I'm just going to be honest and simply talk about the trailer itself, I got to sell the trailer. Anyway, what's next? 
Warner Brothers has released the final trailer for writer-director Ben Affleck's gangster drama Live by Night. Based on the novel of the same name by Dennis Lehane, the film stars Affleck as Joe Coughlin, a World War I vet and son of a Boston police deputy superintendent who operates in the criminal underworld during a Prohibition-era Miami. Live by Night opens in limited release on December 28th and expands wide on January 13th. John, buy saw the final trailer for Live by Night. You know, by kind of releasing this in limited on the 28th of December and releasing it wide in January, Warner Brothers is basically saying, we believe we've got an Oscar contender on our hands. And both of these trailers, including this new one, lead me to believe that they're absolutely correct. I love this trailer. That line, that one line, it goes, so basically you're threatening me with guys who are more powerful than you. <laughs> yeah? Then why am I talking to you? And then Bam. boom. I mean, that was just great. I eat up these types of movies. This trailer got me even more excited for a movie. For me, it's a huge buy, Mark. It's a buy for me as well, John. You know, watching this trailer was like a 17-year-old Mark Ellis finding a Playboy magazine and being like, I know exactly what I'm looking at, and I want more. Because that's what I want from this movie. I mean, this it, it, you feel the Oscar tinges left and right. Ben Affleck looks like he's so committed in this role. This is clearly a passion project for him. We got some good action in here. We got enough story to keep me invested without giving away everything that they're going to be showing us in the movie. This was a very, this might have been the, the best pure trailer of any of the ones we're talking about today. Jeremy. The only thing better than this trailer is Mark's ability to go full circle with those jokes. <laughs> my God. I'm watching a master at work, my friends. No, I, I love this trailer. I love that era. I love crime dramas in that era. You know, those untouchable style uh, movies. Uh, and you have Ben Affleck directing it. The only thing that would make me more excited, I've always wanted to see Tarantino do a movie in the same era that mm. this is in. So, I mean, that would that would get me jacked up. Okay, make it his 10th uh, outing film. But y this is one of the ones to look forward to. Seriously, it is. Kenny. First of all, let's check the mattresses in Mark's apartment right now. <laughs> it might be a little uneven. So a lot um, of cash and a few bags. I'm going <laughs> to buy it because I feel I have to because it checks a lot of like looks right. good and and Affleck's doing his Patriots fan voice I, I was a fan of <laughs> HBO's Boardwalk Empire I actually really liked that show and I saw a lot of the same elements here that look bigger and more epic because it's on the big screen it does I, have that Boardwalk Empire but feel, there's it? a lot of things I was like yeah Boardwalk Empire had that Boardwalk Empire had that it's a similar time frame obviously so uh, I get what they're playing with uh, but I'll buy it because it seems like I'm going to want to see it in the theater and go, yes, that was a good movie. Can I start raining on everybody's parade, though? Because we've seen gangster movies recently have great trailers and not live up to what the trailer showed us, like with Gangster Squad. Oh. Who oh, knew that heavens. movie was going to be as bad as that was? Even a film like Black Mass, which I thought was good, didn't live up to the trailer's promise, as yeah. well as Public Enemies. I thought was a good movie, did not live up to what the trailer built it to be. Yeah, I, oh, so, uh, uh, Public uh, Enemies is one of my favorite books. Brian Burroughs tells a fascinating to uh, story. Michael Mann did a pretty <laughs> good <laughs> You're talking to him about. Oh, books. that's right. I'm sorry. Uh, are there centerfolds <laughs> in books? Yeah, yeah. The Bonnie and Clyde, Melvin Purvis. It's a lot of sexy things. Um, but <laughs> now I lost my train of thought. Uh, but yes, that I kind of had that same right. vibe watching that. Yeah, for me, uh, with, when trailers like this hit, it, it's like you said, it's like a checkbox thing where it's like, I like the era, I like the time, and it's done by a director who so far has not done any wrong. I have no reason to say I don't want to watch this. So I'm looking forward to like that's how I'm like. All right, we press forward with a yes. All right, what's next? The Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them franchise was recently revealed to be a series of five films instead of three, and now it looks as though director David Yates is on board for all of them. During a recent interview with Collider, the director revealed he might be interested in directing the entire series if it comes down to it, saying... I'd like to say I want to stay with it for the whole thing. The only thing that makes my knees wobble a little bit is just the sheer volume. Five movies over eight years is a massive undertaking, so I have to be careful that I'm able to give everything. If there's any point in that period where I go, you know what, it might be wise to step away for a bit, I would, I would to give someone else a shot. But you do become slightly proprietorial. On Potter, once I'd done one, I enjoyed it so much I felt I had to do another one. Then to finish it, I couldn't let anyone finish it. I had to finish it. I was territorial. With this, especially as I've started it, I sort of, I don't know, I feel committed to it. Mark, buy or sell David Yates directing all five movies in the Fantastic Beasts franchise. I would have to sell this, Ashley, even though I'm a fan of David Yates and his directing style. I, I believe I'm the only one on the desk that's actually seen Fantastic Beasts and where to find them, and I was not that uh, overwhelmed with joy watching it. I didn't think it was a great movie. I, I'm not even sure how much I liked the film. That's wow. it, it, just, it, it, it disappointed me because I wanted to get swept up in a world of imagination, and it didn't deliver on that, for me anyway. 
But David Yates is clearly a guy who has a lot of talent. He's great at world building. He's great at setting up these universes. I would sell him doing all five, not because I didn't love Fantastic Beasts, but just because that's five movies with all the same director. I think Harry Potter did a great job of sprinkling in new voices during the run of the 900 movies they made. I'd like to see the same thing with Fantastic Beasts if indeed it becomes a five franchise film. Okay, but what I, I'm, I'm curious to know, the 30-year-old Mark Ellis who finds Playboys in the woods, what's yeah. his reaction to this? I, you know what? Watching Fantastic Beasts, I felt like a 90-year-old Mark Ellis finding a Playboy <laughs> magazine. I don't know what to do with this, and it doesn't stimulate me the way I thought it would. Yeah, I thought it was, uh, yeah, it's like, ooh, Playboy, and Ellis opens it up, and it's Biff's almanac on the <laughs> inside. You know, just sheer disappointment. Um, I'm, I'm going to sell it. Look, I don't like directors staying on one property for too long. I don't think it's good for them. Like, the, the exception is something like Christopher Nolan, where he very wisely would do a Batman film, do a different film do another Batman film, film, then do a different film. Like, so he broke it up. He kept his creativity sharp and fresh. And I just don't like it when directors stay on one property for too long. On that basis alone, I'm going to sell it. What do you think? I'm completely with you. I've never seen a director stay on for that long and have it work out well. We saw Raimi by the by Spider-Man 3 get burned out. This isn't just the five films here. These are This is also the Harry Potter films that he did on top of that. That's a yeah. lot of time in that world. Um, I, I, I want to give the guy a shoulder massage and say, are you sure? I'm glad he prefaced it with well if i feel burned out i will step away i feel like he is absolutely going to do that he might prove me wrong who knows but yeah i'm gonna go ahead and sell that what do you think kenny sell 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 his quote himself he you're right he already sounds tired in his <laughs> yeah. quote like, oh this seems like a lot <laughs> or actually oh, this seems like a lot um <laughs> and he uh he actually had his footprints and, and, and handprints all over the harry potter series doing more of the movies than anyone else he knows the franchise he knows yeah. it is but this isn't harry potter it's another world i have no problem doing in one, two, maybe three, but it's time to get some other voices in there. Produce it, executive producer, stand by, do the Michael Bay with the Transformers, I don't care, but yeah, I'm with you, John. Five movies? Give me a different and voice. Let's also consider the timing of these comments, too, is that it's, what, a week or two before the movie actually comes out, so you want to be as excited as possible, and you want to let everybody out there know, hey, I made a great film, and I'm super excited to come back to this universe, so you guys all come out to see the movie opening weekend. I think it's going to do well. I think it's going to make enough to warrant a franchise. I'm just not sure David Yates, even even wants to be the guy doing all five movies. All right, guys. So listen, there was actually a whole lot of news that came out over the weekend, and we don't have time to go into all of it. So we wanted to get you caught up, make sure you know everything that was going on. So here is our news rundown. Writer-director of The Witch, Robert Eggers, has revealed that his next film will be a remake of Nosferatu. He admitted that the remake of the 1922 horror classic was not what he intended as his next film, but, quote, that's how fate shook out. Eggers revealed that he will be going back to the origins of the folk vampire tale with a release date yet to be determined. Deadline reports that Jessica Chastain is set to star and produce in Painkiller Jane, a movie based on the graphic novel series. Chastain will play Jane Vasco, a New York City street cop who gets recruited by the FBI after a near-death experience, gets her exceptional regenerative abilities and an indestructible advantage. No release date has been set. Variety reports that DreamWorks Animation has decided to scrap their plans for The Croods 2. The film was slated for release on December 22, 2017, before DreamWorks Animation moved from 20th Century Fox to Universal Pictures. The report mentions that there are no near-term plans to bring back the prehistoric family, but sources at Universal did say that The Croods is still very much a part of the DreamWorks catalog. In a report from Variety, Robert Redford has revealed in an interview with his grandson Dylan that he will retire from acting after the completion of production on his final two films. Redford's last two acting projects include Our Souls at Night with Jane Fonda and Old Man with a Gun with Casey Affleck and Sissy Spacek. In a report from The Playlist, Kodak has announced that their film processing facility that handles 65mm film will be utilized for director Colin Trevorrow's Star Wars Episode 9. Reports indicate that the intention is to shoot the entire movie on 65mm film, which is akin to the IMAX format. Trevorrow will be reuniting with Jurassic World cinematographer John Schwartzman for Episode 9, where the two did utilize 65mm format for some scenes in the Jurassic World sequel. Episode 9 is currently set for a release date of May 23, 2019. Deadline is reporting that Penelope Cruz is joining the cast of Murder on the Orient Express, which includes Johnny Depp, Michelle Pfeiffer, Daisy Ridley, Michael Pena, Judi Dench, and Josh Gad, along with Kenneth Branagh, who is starring and also directing the film. Based on the 1934 Agatha Christie novel, the mystery begins after an American businessman is murdered aboard the train and the investigator who tries to solve the murder, finding out that 13 people all had something to do with the victim.
J.K. Rowling has previously told fans that there are gay characters in the Harry Potter world, and now it looks like we may see Albus Dumbledore himself as an openly gay wizard on the big screen in a future Fantastic Beast sequel. During a press conference with the cast and crew, Rowling suggested that this will be a possibility because it's part of a five-part story and that the story will show Dumbledore in a formative period of his life. Now, back to Movie Talk. All right, now that we got you all caught up today with everything that happened on the weekend, it's time to remind you that we do this show live every day, Monday through Friday, at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We just started that today. But as such, we like to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take your live Twitter questions. How do you get a Twitter question to us? It's simple. Make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Fire in your questions, and Wendy will pick a couple out at the end of the show. I also want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show dropping on Collider Video today. A little bit later today at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we've got TV Talk, the newest episode with Josh McCuga and his gang. Also, make sure you stay tuned to our YouTube channel for breaking news that happens throughout the day. And just this morning, we dropped our brand new crash course, probably my favorite we've done so far, hosted by Kenny Napsock on how do Oscar nominations work. We get asked this question all the time in Mailbag, so we thought we would do a video on that. And also, the most recent Walking Dead recap went up last night. You can find it on our channel right now. With all that out of the way, it's time to get to mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question that you'd like us to address in the show, you can just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. We pick out some questions every day. We also have mailbag shows on the weekend, so maybe your question will pop up there. So Ashley, what's in the mailbag today? Chad Wires writes, Hi Collider crew, I was re-watching Clerks 2 the other day, and I love the scene where they are arguing the best trilogy between Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so my question is between the following trilogies, which is the best? Star Wars versus Lord of the Rings versus Back to the Future versus The Godfather. <laughs> it, it pains us a lot of people to say, but you almost have to disqualify The Godfather simply because the third one is not a beloved all-time great film. Still nominated for Best Picture of the Year that year, but let's face it, it you know, compared to the other two, it wasn't that great. So, I mean, the first two films by themselves almost qualified as the greatest trilogy of all time, but you got to kind of remove it. I also want to point out, when people talk about the best trilogy of all time, Everybody always forgets to mention one trilogy, and then I bring it up, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, and seriously think about it. Toy Story. The, the three mm -hmm. Toy Story films are, like, I think all three of them were the highest critically rated films of their respective years that each one of those films came out. And it ended with an absolute masterpiece with Toy Story 3, but obviously, you're talking to me, it's going to be Star Wars. Look, Lord of the Rings is amazing. The Return of the King has the all-time record tied, I believe, with 11 Academy Awards. No other film has won more Academy Awards than uh, Lord of the Rings Return of the King. But when you look at the influence that Star Wars has had as a tri the original trilogy over filmmaking as a whole in the industry, I believe, and I'm a little bit biased, I admit, but I believe Star Wars is the greatest trilogy of all time. And what do you think? It, it's not even a question. It's, it, it's a nice mailbag treat, but it's not even a question. Star Wars, the classic trilogy, is the greatest three films in the history of mankind, in my humble opinion. I actually think Jedi is the best one of the three, but I love them all. And the reason why, one of the reasons why I'll put it ahead of Lord of the Rings or any other trilogy for that matter, is simply because you get such a different tone from movie to movie to movie. Whereas Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship does start out happier and then it gets a little darker with uh, the to the two towers and then it gets even darker with return of the king but i think that what star wars is able to do is will never be matched in the history or the future of cinema two other trilogies of note though is the the first three indiana jones movies oh absolutely I think, are yeah. damn near perfect and the born trilogy is pretty damn good as far as action movies go as with the first three diehards what do you think what uh, jeremy what's the best uh, or your favorite <laughs> It's like this. Uh, when people ask me my favorite uh, movie, I always flip-flop between uh, Lord of the Rings, which I, I say is all one movie, and Empire Strikes Back. And so I was talking with my friend about it. Here's how it happened. So we had Star War the Star Wars trilogy. It was the greatest trilogy of all time. We all loved it. And then the prequels came out and let us all down. And Lord of the Rings came in and said, hey, kid, we got some candy. Come on over <laughs> here. And so everyone went over there, and we're like, whoa, that is really good. And those uh, prequels kept coming out. We're like, no, we got Lord of the Rings. We're fine. Then Lord of the Rings took the, uh, they took the spot light away from Star Wars then Star Wars comes back in a very big way now Star Wars in the spectrum again if I have to choose my answer is yeah <laughs> <laughs> Kenny if I don't choose Star Wars then I wasted being a virgin for so long <laughs> <laughs> all right um, 
it's very hard to not say that. Uh, and also, the great question, Chad. But throwing in Godfather's like saying, do you want steak, mashed potatoes, and cake, or this nice fish and asparagus? Godfather <laughs> is kind of its own thing when you're talking about fandoms and trilogies. Mm -hmm. I know it's, we're talking about movies, but I'm, you have to factor in the fandoms and the lore and the sagas. Um, I'm going stars, but I will say this. Uh, and Back to the Future is a good choice, too. Oh, uh, it's uh, a great first. I film. am the, one of the people that uh, once a year I'll put on all the extended editions of the original, the, the, the first three Lord of the Rings movies, and I'll watch them to my eyeballs come out. All endings, I don't care, all 42 endings of Return of the Kings. I love those movies, and they're very, very, very high on the list, but Star Wars is my life. So is there no perfect trilogy, though? Because even Star Wars, like, like obviously they went back into the cookie jar with the prequels, and then with The Force Awakens and all these new great movies hopefully coming out. Indiana Jones couldn't keep its perfect trilogy together because they went back with Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. You have Lord of the Rings went back with the Hobbit prequels. You know, you have all these movies. There, there's no perfect trilogy because the reason why there's no more Back to the Future movies is, look, I, I, I appreciate Back to the Future 2 and 3, but we didn't need any more Back to the Future movies after that. They, no, it, really. it had kind of run its course. I, will, I would argue, though, um, if you compartmentalize the trilogies themselves, Lord of the Rings, just them, not Hobbit, but Lord of the Rings right. as a trilogy might be the most perfect as you can pick out the other ones like that's the that's the eyes oh, that's the one that's not as good that's the one that's not as good lord of the rings as a trilogy themselves i totally awesome. agree with you if star wars the classic trilogy didn't exist and the, the, the ewoks though the yep. ewoks are Don't what is wrong going with on you? the ewoks the yep. ewoks are they're adorable awesome. they're furry they're 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 monsters they're they, they're reekers of mayhem <laughs> they will hunt you they will trap you they will burn you alive open fire they will eat your flesh and use your severed head as an instrument in their victory you dance. know what i just realized they are awesome you know what i realized they are the ewoks are like the tribbles of the star wars world you know there's like the great klingons their nemesis is the tribbles in star trek star wars is the Ewoks. are tribbles from lord of the rings yes <laughs> i consider tribbles bantha poodoo in the star wars galaxy <laughs> I, I, I wendy what about you what would you say is your favorite trilogy of all time afraid for Jeremy over there who's gonna get jumped or something by you guys. Oh, I'm gonna get shipped hard. <laughs> uh, for me, I'm gonna go with, you stay in your seat, Mark Ellis. I'm gonna go with Lord of the Rings. It's just slightly edges out Star Wars. Just slightly. I know what you're saying, Wendy. What about you, I Ashley? I'm stuck between Star Wars and The Godfather, and I think that they're so different in a sense that they oh, both Oh, absolutely. Win. So, that's a tie for me. All right, it's a tie. Okay, what's next? Jeff Bingham writes, in light of the recent underperformance of various sequels this year, do you think studios will start to take more of a second look as to whether audiences will want a sequel to a particular film? You know, it, it's not just sequels. that the, Like, every year, the vast majority, like, a lot of original films underperform at the box office as well. And, you know, the, the ratio for that is no less painful for sequels as well. Yeah, sometimes some sequels get made that you kind of scratch your head and go, what the heck were they thinking? Like, for instance, the first Star Trek movie was was bad. It was bad. I love Star Trek. And even I, when I go back and watch, like, oh, this one kind of hurts to watch. And then they decide, we're going to make another one. It's like, really? You're going to make another one? But if they didn't, we never would have got Wrath of Khan, one of the greatest sci-fi films of all time. I thought the first Rush Hour sucked, to be honest with you. I didn't like But Rush Hour 2, I think, is surprisingly great. I thought the first three Fast and Furious movies were garbage. But I've loved all the Fast and Furious movies that come after that. But then you get some sequels that don't work. Like, look, do studios have to be careful about what they green light? Yes. But that's just as true of original films that fail just as frequently as they do with sequels. So I don't really think there's a big difference. I don't know. Mark, how do you see it? My take is that you're going to have to have a run of bad sequels that is unprecedented in the history of time because you're going to have to have years when no good <laughs> sequel comes out for Hollywood really to take a step back and be like, we should stop making so many sequels. And here's the reason is that, look, do we need another trip? X movie? Probably not. Do we need another train spotting movie? I don't I didn't hear a lot of people asking for it, but maybe it's great. However, when you have greatness that comes out in the form of a sequel, like what we hopefully will get with Episode 8, what we already got with The Force Awakens, what we hopefully will get with War for the Planet of the Apes, when you have that as a shimmering example, every studio is going to look at that and be like, that's a franchise. That We want that. So it doesn't really matter what the other movies are doing quality-wise. As long as they see those on the hilltops, they think they can get there. So whether John Wick is going to be able to do that, whether a, a the, the Wolverine or the, the Fast eight movies can, can continue to do what they have been doing it's irrelevant because there's always going to be a mountaintop with a great king that we all do want to see continue to make sequels kenny hollywood is just a bunch of executives trying to save their jobs i don't even mean that it's a joke it's just business it's survival so until a trend if a rival 
took forty-five million of the box office and won, someone would be like, "Ah, let's start making more movies." I that's a great point, John. Fast and Furious, I think we all wrote it off. It was like straight to DVD land, and yeah. all of a sudden they reinvent it. Star Trek II is a great example, too. So I believe in redemption, but I'm, I'm staring at Johnny Depp uh, <laughs> <laughs> going to the labyrinth of masquer Jareth, uh, masquerade ball there. It scares me. Um, but it's, it's all about trends. It's all about business. So until something changes, Hangover 1 made this. You got mm -hmm. Go Picture on Hangover 2. Yeah. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I agree with Mark. It's, I mean... Every sequel out there, you can have so many sequels suck, and all it takes is one for hope. You can have every sequel beat down and give up on life. And if you get one John Connor sequel, mm -hmm. it will raise everything up, and then more sequels happen. I mean, uh, a, a lot of the sequels that are ha uh, huge hitters are were because the first one did well, you know? And so, I mean, it, it takes a good first movie to make a... Like a big second movie to save those executives' jobs. But uh, if, if sequels burn out, shoot, there's always reboots. <laughs> but here's the thing, too, to remember really quickly, is that I think that we are going to see that trend change with comedies that have lasted too long without getting a sequel. Because we got Dumb and Dumber, or right. Dumb and Dumber 2, whatever it was. People didn't like it as much. Got Zoolander 2. It was atrocious. So yeah. I think that, that it like, like a movie like Old School, where it totally deserved, warranted, box office wise, to get a sequel. I don't think you're ever going to see that because they look at it like, you know what, we're going to have to leave well enough. Yeah, there was a window of opportunity. Right. We missed it. It's time to move on to something yeah, else. Right. All right, guys, I said we'd save some time for your Twitter questions. I'm going to do that right now. Wendy, what have you picked out? Okay, so despite the announcement that we're moving Movie Talk to earlier time, everybody in the chat room and on Twitter wants to know. So Movie Fan 0330 says, why did the time change? Is it just easier for everyone? Uh, there's a couple reasons we made the time change. One of the biggest ones is that we are actually getting busier around here. And with Movie Talk starting at 11, that means there's a shorter rest of the day for us to do all the other production we want to do. Quite often, like, there's a huge crew of guys that work here that, like, will often, like, not even get a chance to have lunch in a day because everything is just crammed and we're running as fast as we can to get to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. And one of the major reasons we moved it to 10 instead of 11 was to free up room in the day, to add an extra hour to the rest of our production day to get everything done that we need to get done. The other kind of reason, it's a smaller reason, but is that, you know, at 11 o'clock, that means movie talk isn't going live on the East Coast until 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And we thought we'd probably make it easier if we moved it a little bit earlier. So for that and a whole bunch of other smaller reasons, that's why we moved it to 10 a.m. All right, what's next? All right, next one comes from, I lost it, Nick, who writes, what are some of your most beloved movie posters of all time? The Back to the Future poster is absolutely perfect in my eyes. Oh, there are so many. I mean, my idea of a, of a perfect movie poster is one that captures the spirit of the movie in one frame. And the Back to the Future ones yeah. really do yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. What, do you, what are some of your favorite posters? There's of all one that we get to look at quite frequently when we're here in the studio. And it's a movie I didn't even see until three years ago, I think. It was the first time I witnessed the Shawshank Redemption. But that poster, everything that you need to know about that movie is in that poster. And then on a more sentimental, personal, not as good movie note, the Hard Target poster I just think is tremendous. It is just so good. <laughs> you see Van Damme at his apex, but he's got like this cool mullet and you're like, oh, what's, he's got a mullet now. And it's inside that arrow. And you're like, what are they doing with arrows in this movie? I'm going to have to go see the film 30 times. <laughs> I don't know. What's your favorite posters? You know, uh, I, I got to say, uh, talking about the Back to the Future posters, those have so much subtlety in them. And every poster, the DeLorean is different. In the first one, there's just Marty. Second one, there's two people. Third one, there's three people. Mm -hmm. They're all checking different timepieces in every poster. Then they're checking pocket watches in the third one. I've never seen a series of posters work together in tandem as well as the Back to the Future posters. But I really love the teaser poster for V for Vendetta. It was pulled when they pulled it from the 5th of November, and then it went right. to March. But it's just like coming from him and his back and his back is turned and it says remember remember the 5th of November I love that I, I when I worked at the movie theater I stole it <laughs> yeah, okay. I have it what about you Kenny if it's got Katherine Heigl back to back with some guy doing this, <laughs> I love it I love it ah no kidding you know uh, my old office which was outside the industry I had some fun posters hanging I had the out of sight poster Jennifer Lopez, oh, yeah, George really Clooney was an old style 60s classic. I like some of the more recent Bond posters. Does a great job of making me look like I look like that when I wear a suit. I don't. Um, <laughs> but one that's about to go up my office here, John. It's one of my all time favorite movie posters. It has a little kid on a desert planet. And his shadow. <laughs> 
is that of Lord Darth Vader. Yeah! yeah. The yeah, Phantom Menace poster. teaser poster is one of the best things in Star Wars. It's going to be hanging in my office soon. I still have it. That's a, It's one of my favorite posters, one of my favorite trailers of all time. And the chat room, it's not just here to humble me. It's also here to remind us sometimes of movies we forgot. Jaws is one of the <laughs> oh, all-time so great good. Good movie posters. Thank you to the denizens of people who actually said Jaws. It's the right answer. And E.T., like, that was a classic yeah, one as well. Yeah. Anything by Drew Struzan. I mean, it's going to be ranked up there, too. And not just because it's a good movie, but the Empire Strikes Back poster, because it was the first one you have, like, Han and Leia doing a dip. You know, it's yeah. like it shows the romance with them and Vader's all ominously looking over them. It's just those, there's something about those old posters. It's like they knew what they had to put on there, and they knew it was timeless, and they were works of <laughs> art is what they were. I swear. Also, anything with a guy with sunglasses or a kid with sunglasses, and he's dipping them, like hey, something crazy is about to happen <laughs> in this movie. <laughs> 90s, baby. All right, let's take two more. All right, Chris Hartwell writes, now that you've seen Doctor Strange, which MCU character are you most excited to see him interact with? Mm. Oh, gosh. To question. see Strange uh, interact with. Well, spoilers, Doctor Strange doesn't die in this movie. Uh, so there will be sequels. <laughs> but John! <laughs> um, I, I'll be honest. I, I think I am really curious to see him interact with Odin. I would love to see him interact with Odin. So that, that would be mine. I, I was thinking Loki just because of the trickery that Loki can do and the trickery that and magic that both of these guys can do. Right. I feel like you'll see a fight that is that of... Well, Portal Combat, which is pretty much what Portal they did at the, at the end of Thor 2. But uh, I, I think those two can blow our minds. Kenny? Arrogant rich man gets humbled, becomes a spiritual kind of warrior. I want to see him sit down with Tony Stark and talk about his sins. I want, uh, I want them to get together and have kind of like this deep, uh, my dinner with Andre conversation. It's never going to happen, but... <laughs> That'd be interesting. See, I was going to take Tony Stark, and since you <laughs> took it, now I have to check to my backup, which is I want to see Doctor Strange interact with Hawkeye because I think it would be like an office space, the meetings with the Bobs. Doctor Strange sits down. <laughs> he's got Hawkeye across from him. He's like, now what exactly would you say it is you do here? <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get paid, kids. <laughs> All right, last question of the day. The last one comes from John Lee, who writes, with the new start time for Collider Movie Talk, is there going to be a different start time for all the other shows? Um, well, we've already made one little shift in the schedule. For instance, Heroes, as we announced earlier, Heroes has now moved back to its original air date on Tuesdays. Nightmares has moved to Wednesdays. Keep your eyes open for all the further announcements of time. But as for everything else, is pretty much staying in place. But we will let you guys know as we make other programming changes. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Again, the first one we've done at 10, the first one with all the new studio setup and gear. Thank you so much for your patience and hanging in there with us today. We really appreciate it. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, over there, Mr. Ken Knapsack. Ken, where can people find you online? You can find me at Ken Knapsack, John. When my alarm went off a half hour earlier this morning, I said, curse you, Campy. It's a good business decision. See you at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jeremy Johns. Jeremy, have you adjusted yourself to L.A. life yet? No, well, I, I adjusted myself to L.A. life just in time for you to mess up my sleeping schedule, John. <laughs> it's, uh, when I came here, I was like, I'm a night owl. And John was like, that's great. We'll give you one week to climatize and we're going back one hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, really, my dogs have adjusted surprisingly well. I'm getting there. So where can people find you online? Oh, they can find me on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Jeremy Johns. We talk me some movies, and by we, I mean I and we. Over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you and your stash of Playboys? Oh, well, you can find those under my mattress currently or in the closet. When you have a girlfriend that lives with you, you got to find tricky places to hide them. That <laughs> oven, don't turn it on until I have a say-so. Make sure you guys follow me on Twitter, at Mark Ellis Live. And this weekend, I will be doing stand-up at the world-famous comedy store in La Jolla, just north of San Diego. So all you San Diegans, I know you love your day drinking. Come out and laugh at night. Get your tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. And, of course, Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And Wendy Lee. You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you guys can simply follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at John Campion. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.